It was August 15th, 1944. Allied armies were working to close the Falaise Pocket, cutting off German Army Group B and laying open the road to Paris. In Italy, the Allied armies had moved beyond Rome and captured Florence and were about to assault Hitler's Gothic Line. And in southern France, the mighty guns of USS Texas, just two months after having supported the landings at Omaha Beach, were being called upon for yet another Allied landing on mainland France. Part of a battle fleet of five battleships, 20 cruisers and nine escort carriers supporting the landing of some 150,000 American and French troops. In the shadow of Operation Overlord, Operation Dragoon is often overlooked, yet it played an important role in the liberation of France. And it was there that USS Texas would face unique challenges. A battleship of the First World War making unprecedented use of the technology of the Second in a prelude to the high-tech navies of today. It is history that deserves to be remembered. In December 1943, the Allies met in Tehran for a conference about planning for the war effort. It was the first time that President Franklin Roosevelt, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin met. The focus was in operational planning for 1944. All three agreed to support Operation Overlord and the Soviets promised a summer offensive on the Eastern Front. One of the major points of contention was where and how another front could be opened in Europe in the Mediterranean. Churchill advocated for an operation against the Balkans, while General Dwight Eisenhower and Roosevelt preferred an invasion of southern France. Stalin would come to support the Americans, at least in part because he considered the Balkans part of the Soviet zone of influence. Originally dubbed Operation Anvil to match an earlier plan for the invasion of northern France called Operation Sledgehammer, Anvil was meant to support the northern invasion, acting as a pincer that would crush the German forces in France. By the end of the conference, Anvil was one of two supreme operations of 1944, and Allied strategists wrote that nothing must be undertaken which hazards the success of these two operations. Issues with Operation Anvil appeared soon afterwards. Initially, Anvil was meant to take place on the same day as Overlord and be as large as available landing craft would permit. The British, especially Churchill, thought the attack in southern France was a mistake. Churchill thought more resources should be put into the stalled Italian campaign, but planning for Operation Overlord was growing more ambitious, and as the plans expanded to include more divisions, it became clear that there was one insurmountable problem facing the combined invasion. There simply weren't enough landing craft. Anvil was postponed in favor of the expanded Overlord. In April, Anvil was postponed indefinitely, but shortly after, the Americans returned to supporting the invasion to bring in more troops via the southern ports. Only six weeks before it was launched, the Allies finally agreed to operations to be launched by the 15th of August, with the new designation, Dragoon. The USS Texas was chosen to support the landing, along with the USS Nevada in Arkansas, as well as the British battleship Rambles and the French Lorraine. The Texas had not been damaged at D-Day, but had taken a shell in the bombardment of Cherbourg on June 25th. She went into repairs at Plymouth before drilling for her next operation. On July 16th, the Texas set out for the Mediterranean and reached Italy at the end of July. During the preparation, the ship was allowed time for a USO show aboard the ship, which included actor Jack Haley, who played the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz. Unlike the landings at Normandy, the forces defending the French Riviera were not well trained or supplied. German Army Group G, the Army Group had a single army under its command, and though the Germans suspected a possible invasion in southern France, simply did not have the forces to defend the region adequately. The forces there had been steadily stripped of their best equipment and best units throughout the war, an issue which only grew worse after the Normandy landings, when many units were sent north to contain the Allied assault. All of the remaining divisions were under strength, and only a single Panzer Division was present, and one of its two battalions had been sent north. Many of the units were Ostelegionen, or Eastern Legions, made up largely of specific ethnic groups from the Soviet Union who volunteered or were coerced into forming German units that performed rear area activities or coastal defense to free up better trained German units. Johannes Blaskowitz, commander of Army Group G, was aware that a landing was coming, but he knew that he could not effectively oppose it. He was already making plans for withdrawal in July. The coast was well protected by extensive coastal artillery positions, and the Vichy French government had placed around 75 defensive guns in the area. The Allies planned to land three divisions of the American 7th Army on the first day to be supported by French Army B, who was the first full French army to participate in the liberation. The soldiers of Army B were experienced from combat in the Italian campaign and the liberation of Corsica. The landings would be preceded by French, U.S., and Canadian commando strikes on key points to silence coastal guns, and the first airborne task group, made up of American and British paratroopers, was to land and secure high ground positions behind the beaches. 
French resistance forces would act in concert, rising against German forces in an effort to keep them from responding to the landings. The landing zone was divided into three sections, Alpha, Delta, and Camel. Texas was assigned with the Nevada to support the landing in the Delta section as part of the heavy bombardment group. The invasion force anticipated heavy resistance. Texas had left Taranto on August 11th and arrived at the assault area at 3.40 a.m. on August 15th. An hour later, Texas reported hearing but not seeing the first bombs of the pre-landing aerial bombardment. One airman involved in the massive attack recalled that a pall of smoke and dust hung over the entire area. The Texas' first target was five 220mm guns. Smoke and dust, the airman noted, made it difficult for Texas spotter planes to aim. Smoke had also been put down on the beaches to screen the landings. Visibility is not good, a spotter reported at 627. Think it will improve after sunrise. The plane reported that the emplaced guns were firing, but that it could not confirm any of the shots coming from the ship. The battleship reported low overcast and haze, as well as dust from the bombing, and was unable to see the shore. An emergency plan was activated, and the USS Fitch moved forward to act as a spotter. The Texas and the rest of the bombardment group were ordered to fire at targets whether spotting was possible or not. The Fitch was finally able to spot the battleship's salvos. Later, another destroyer radioed in to report that the target was being effectively covered. Though they struggled to spot their targets, the Texas judged their mission successful. Not one gun flash was observed from the enemy battery assigned to the Texas at any time until it was occupied by our own troops. The ship continued to offer fire support throughout the day at several targets, expending 172 14-inch shells before retiring to their nighttime position. The following day they took position but saw no enemy activity and weren't asked to provide fire support. Perhaps most impressive about Texas's fire support was that all of their fire was coordinated via radar via the ship's combat information center. The after-action report noted that at no time were any navigational landmarks visible from the ship and the ship's position was determined entirely by SG radar and bearings. Of 32 salvos, 26 were viewed by the Fitch, and 80% of those fell in the target area. The destroyer Rodman had to approach the shore and was relieved when they could report that Texas's fire was accurate, thanks due to the ship's range keepers and radar. The Texas was the first U.S. ship to equip a range keeper in 1916, an early analog version of a computer that could assist with fire control and do the complex calculations necessary to direct long-range gunfire. The Texas was also among the first 14 U.S. Navy ships equipped with CXAM radar in 1941. The combination of the two, range keepers and radar, allowed the ship to accurately target enemy positions even when visibility was low. At Delta Beach, the landings had gone smoothly, almost without enemy opposition. 33,000 men and over 3,000 vehicles were landed in an hour without casualty, and the landing force accomplished all of their objectives with losses of only 109. While the Texas was on hand the day after the landing, ground forces inspected the defenses on the shore and found that the defenders were dead at their post. Those who weren't had fled from the bombardment entirely. The only landing to be seriously opposed was at Camel Beach, where the Allies were unable to land at the section designated Camel Red thanks to well-placed coastal guns and flak batteries. Landings continued at Camel Blue and Camel Green without significant resistance. Ultimately, only 95 Allied soldiers were killed and 385 wounded in the initial landing. French resistance groups completely severed German communication lines in the attack, preventing German commanders from organizing a better defense. Resistance fighters and paratroopers provided resistance inland that prevented countermeasures from being easily moved forward. On the night of August 16th, only one day after the landings, Hitler was forced to break his no-step-backwards orders in order to complete withdrawal of Army Group G. Pre-Dragoon attacks had destroyed five of the eight German U-boats stationed at Toulon, and the Kriegsmarine was unable to offer significant resistance. The Texas was ordered back to Italy on August 17th, as Allied units were already storming beyond the beaches and targets were out of range. Dragoon was her final action in the European theater, and she would be reassigned to the Pacific to participate in the battles of Iwo Jima and Okinawa afterward. Meanwhile, the forces that landed in southern France retook huge swaths of the country in just four weeks, driving the Germans to the mountains near the border of Germany. By mid-September, Dragoon forces successfully met with the forces from Overlord, who had broken out of the beachhead. The captured ports in the Mediterranean provided the Allies with vital supply lines to support the ongoing campaign. More than a third of the supply tonnage moved to the Western Front in October 1944 came through southern France. The assault also likely saved much of France from serious fighting, as the Germans withdrew without offering serious resistance. The operation, while notably successful, was criticized both at the time by men like Churchill and General Bernard Montgomery, as well as by later historians for drawing forces away from other theaters. 
The UK command especially remained bitter about being overruled in their hopes to support either the Italian campaign or movement into the Balkans and Central Europe. He continued to argue against the wisdom of Dragoon well after the war and argued that a campaign in the Balkans or Central Europe could have stalled the spread of communism that became central issues of the Cold War. For his part, Supreme Allied Commander Dwight Eisenhower thought it was the right call, saying that there was no development of that period which added more decisively to our advantages than this secondary attack coming up the Rhone Valley. Fortress Europe was definitively broken, and the war was now at Hitler's doorstep. But whatever the various objections as to the operation's wisdom, it was undoubtedly successful. Perhaps the most successful amphibious operation of the war in terms of the ability of the landing forces to meet their objectives on time and with minimal losses. Its circumstances were unique. The defenses had been depleted and were guarded by soldiers unlikely to withstand serious attack, and the actual landings were largely unopposed. But Dragoon also shows just how much the Allies had learned about amphibious operations since Texas had supported Operation Torch in 1942. But it was also the most definitive proof yet of the importance of shipboard technologies that were effectively remaking naval warfare. The Texas, which is today the world's last remaining super dreadnought of the World War I era, was in 1944 mounted with the best equipment available. But the Texas had literally been launched before the invention of radar. It was just the first U.S. naval vessel to be mounted with an analog fire control computer. The Texas straddled, it bridged the gap between the period of ship-to-ship -ship fighting that had defined naval combat since its conception and the modern navies of today. Today, the USS Texas is the last remaining of the World War I-era dreadnoughts. She was the first American battleship to be made a permanent museum and the first to be designated a U.S. National Historic Landmark. But her long years at the dock at the San Jacinto Battlegrounds historic site have taken a toll on her. The Battleship Texas Foundation has embarked on a campaign to restore the ship. And if you are interested in helping to preserve this piece of American history, the Foundation encourages you to shout, Come on, Texas! and donate at BattleshipTexas.org. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.